Army's on the move. Army's on the march. They, they're always needing places to set up hospitals. There's always houses to commandeer, barns to commandeer, and this is where we find ourselves today, in a, in a, a commandeered house. Medical theory through time has evolved. Uh, and, you know, to this time, to my time period, which is the time period of the American Civil War, um, we've, we've come a long ways. If you think about it, I mean, we're, here, we're here in North Carolina. If you think back, probably the, some of the first military expeditions in North Carolina involved the Spanish and, of course, the English. Um, who eventually settled this area. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh sent uh, quite a few expeditions, and most famous of those being the Lost Colony. And what would any expedition have would be military practitioners, medical practitioners, in the form of apothecaries and surgeons and physicians. And in the 1600s, 15, late 1500s and 1600s, you're looking at um, medical theory based around the balancing of the four humors of the body, that being black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. Galen, the, the great medical um, genius that he was, uh, traveled around the, the, the Mediterranean area and in Europe, and, and he picked up a lot of different ideas. And he, all of these fit into his, the way he looked at the balances of the four humors of the body. This, this concept actually came, went back further than even Galen, going back to Hippocrates. And when someone was sick, they, their, their humors were out of balance. So how do you bring these fluids back into balance? Well, you bleed someone. That's the first thing. Um, maybe taking 12 ounces, 16 ounces, 24 ounces of blood, then you would purge that patient. Now, when you think of purging, well, how, what would you use? Well, one of the first things you would use would be a clyster. Uh, this being a, a pewter syringe that you would fill sometimes with uh, warm salt water and you would vacate the lower digestive system of the body. You could also do that as well, giving certain medications. Um, now, to, to vacate the upper digestive system, you would give something, um, some kind of epicac syrup, things of that nature, that would cause the patient to vomit. And the thought is, by balancing, bringing those fluids back into balance, that you could make the patient well again. Well, this was beginning, the, the, you saw the four humors, and, and the, the ideas of the humors stayed with us well into the 18th century. But you also, at the same time, had surgeons and physicians looking at external uh, things that would affect a person's health. And one of the, the theories that lasted for well into the, the 19th century, well past the Amer this time period of the American Civil War, uh, was that of the miasmas. When you think of the miasmas, well, it's bad air, simply put. It's, it's air as, as uh, the, the soil is decomposing, as foliage decomposes, as animals decompose. It's the gases that are given off that could be cause you to be sick. Famously, here in eastern North Carolina, uh, one of the, the, the gunboats that operated here, the USS Miami, was nicknamed the USS Miasma because of the number of sick patients that they had. Um, and they thought it was coming from gases from the swamp and from the river that, that were causing them to have different fevers and other problems. But the miasmas did last a very long period of uh, time until it was supplanted by figuring out that germs were the actual root cause. And of course, we didn't know that during the American Civil War. We were still operating with the idea of the miasmas. There was another theory as well going along with the miasmas is there might have been some contaminant that you had taken in. They didn't know why it made you sick, they just knew it made you sick. This drove General Washington, in, in early in his career, to
to lay out orders when he first took over the Continental Army in Massachusetts to go in and say, okay, so latrines must be dug in a certain area. Camp kitchens must be located in another area, afar apart from the latrines. And if you're, you're gathering water for, for consumption, make sure you, you're doing this upstream from where you would water your horses, or where there's a ford, or where even the soldiers are taking their baths. You still, even though the humors were becoming less and less looked at and used as a, uh, an excuse for our illness, you were still using the same therapies, though. You were still bleeding. You were still purging. You would, and, and be honest with you, the medications and whatnot, the, the, everything was basically the same. But the reason behind the therapies well, they changed. Even this time, I'm using the same therapies, albeit I'm an older surgeon, so I believe in bleeding a patient. So if you come to me with an illness, I'm going to bleed you. We'll bleed you 12, 16, 24 ounces. I'm also going to purge you. But this is going by the wayside. And even now, even here, we're changing how we look at how we treat our patients. Now, I've talked in a lot of generalities, and you can apply what we've just discussed to, to a military setting and, and also to a regular setting that you might find yourselves in, in this time period and before. I find myself, at the beginning of this conflict, uh, joining the Union Army. I joined and was given the rank of assistant surgeon uh, and later was promoted to a full surgeon, which is a, basically a major. I've seen so much death and destruction um, applying the brutal craft as I have to do. My education for this, quite frankly, did not prepare me for the carnage that I've seen. And I think if I were to go back and have to ask some of my predecessors, going back in time, they would agree. While we were familiar with anatomy, uh, we had attended, at least in my time period, attended anatomy classes. Cutting on a human body without doing it before um, is pretty daunting. But you use the training that you did receive. I was lucky enough, I attended medical school in Philadelphia, and I did serve under uh, another practitioner for a number of years uh, before setting out into my own practice. Funny how, over time, the medical practitioners and their training, their education, has changed a bit. If we go back to the anywhere of the 15 and 1600s, um, you're looking at medical practitioners being divi divided into to really three major parts. You have physicians, and the physicians are the highbrow people. They're the ones who get medical degrees. Um, they typically never they never get their hands dirty. They do a lot of they examine. They may even conduct an examination by letter, uh, and then they prescribe. And then they look to the apothecaries who, they operate their own stores, their chemists, they make the medications. Sometimes you visit their storefront and, and you'll tell them your ailment and they'll make it on their own without a physician. And typically apothecaries are they're trained as apprentices, usually seven to eight years. Then you have surgeons. Surgeons are craftsmen. I mean, for goodness sakes, if you look at a saw such as this, wouldn't you think that he's a carpenter? Because that's what a lot of these instruments resemble. Tools that we use in everyday life. But you're taught a craft and, and you're taught how to dress 
by serving again as an apprentice. And if you're lucky enough and you live in one of the major cities or travel there, especially in Europe, specifically in Europe, and in England, Scotland, Paris, you gain a position as a dresser, first of all, and then you progress up the chain until you're serving next to one of the, maybe a surgeon such as, oh, I don't know, James Sims, like you would find in Scotland today. Or if you were in the 18th century, maybe uh, someone like William Cullen or, or John Hunter, if you were lucky. It was all hands-on. And over time, and you can read about it in the, the, the historical papers, physicians would get angry with surgeons because they saw them as practicing. But quite frankly, the everyday person may not be able to afford a physician if they were sick. So they would go to the surgeon. And of course, the patient healed would refer to that person as a doctor. And there's court cases that involve this. But by the time of this period, a lot of things have changed. Even in a military setting, a lot of things have changed. You no longer have your positions being bought and sold. You, you actually have to sit before a board after you have graduated in your, from medical school. You have to sit before a, a board who who will give you either yes or no that you can even serve in the army as a surgeon. And then you're sent off to some far post Indian country where you serve with people that, that you're their only medical hope. Medical treatments over the time period from a military standpoint um, did change. Um, beginning, again, starting back at, at the, the first military practitioners here in North Carolina, um, the Europeans, they would have been using lots of botanicals. Um, and in fact, if, if you if you look back at history, you'll find that is one of the reasons for uh, especially Sir Walter Raleigh's uh, expeditions was to identify uh, certain plants that could be used as medicines. <laughs> one of those being sassafras, which is plentiful here in North Carolina. Uh, and they tried, they were thinking that it would be a miracle drug to cure what we today refer to as the French pox or, well, whoever's enemy you're against, but venereal diseases, uh, because they had still not figured out that it took something. Quite frankly, we still, we don't have, even during the time of the American Civil War, which are antibiotics. You, but you began to see the progression towards the end of the 18th century to more manufactured drugs. So they learned how to take the tincture of the bark, which is the tincture uh, alcohol form um, using uh, what, what we know is the, the, the plant, the cinchona tree, that bark contains quinine, which treats malaria, or as we refer to it as intermittent fevers. They figured out how to go in and distill down, process down into the actual quinine form. Um, part of that was using sulfuric acid. They also learned to, to use, take opium, that wonderful painkiller, actually the only painkiller, we strong painkiller we actually have, they learned how to distill it down to a stronger form in the form of morphine, the arms of Morpheus. And truly it was a, a, a wonder drug once we were able to do it. Sadly, by the time of the Civil War, and because of the Civil War, there was a disease that came out, uh, came into a, to a being because of it, a little disease by the name of the soldier's disease, and it was basically opiate addiction. Um, so those are, you see that progression of medicines. Interesting enough, here in this conflict I found myself in, the Confederates 
our enemies, the rebels, they've had to resort to going back to some of the older remedies because of our blockade around their borders. And they can no longer get shipments of a lot of drugs that aren't available to them. They don't have, the, the is, and it's not the fact that they don't have the manufacturing capability, because they do, they make their own ether. They make a lot of some of their other chemicals. It's the fact that their raw materials aren't available here. So they revert back. And they've gone back to using some of the older, older type and older style drugs. And when you think of some of the older forms of drugs that we were talking about, well, here's the, the, the uh, quinine pills. Quinine sulfatis. They, they're a, not able to get quinine through the blockade. And if they do, it's in small amounts. Why is quinine important? Well, we're in the South. There's lots of water. What does that breed? Lots of mosquitoes. Now, in this time period, I thought it was the bad air. I thought it was because of miasmas. But it's not. It's actually because of a mosquito and a parasite that mosquito has. And quinine controls it. In fact, it makes it go away. It takes care of that intermittent fever. Then you, you have opium. Opium is one of the things we're easily, we're able to easily get. Um, we prefer Turkish opium being the best. Indian opium, second best. But the South, again, they can't get access to the, the raw material. So they start growing their own. Yes, here in North Carolina. But because of the changes in, of the soils and the other environmental factors, it's not as strong. So they have to use a higher dosage to get the, the effect they want. We talked a little bit about um, the idea of, of anesthesia. We talked about ether. I mentioned that the, the South had laboratories that was making anesthesia. And here is a canister from my pannier uh, that is, contains chloroform. To me, that's probably one of the biggest advances. Uh, both chloroform and ether coming about in the 1840s. Uh, ether first as an anesthetic and later chloroform. It revolutionized the way we did surgeries. First, we could take longer because the, the patient was not in pain. Prior to anesthesia, it, it should take me about uh, probably three minutes at the most to amputate an arm and a leg. I could take longer. I could do a better job. Now there's some dangers with that because the patient, again, being exposed could have greater chances of infection. But on top of that, they also had a greater chance of blood loss. So there's kind of a, a double-edged sword with being able to use that. But probably the biggest thing that came about with the use of anesthesia is the fact that the soldiers did not have to endure the pain and the agony of having to have their arm or leg removed without it. And up till then, up to the 1840s, that's what happened. The patient was wide awake, was typically giving, given something to bite upon, like a piece of leather, a stick wrapped in cloth, not a bullet, because the first thing's going to happen when I start cutting on a patient and he screams, he'd swallow a bullet. But the idea you're able to take that patient to a point that he's aware of some of what's going on, but he's not feeling the pain and not having to endure the pain, it changes the entire way he recovers. Actually, it's a, it's a much, he, he recovers quicker uh, and with less trauma. A lot of people, the public, will hear soldiers crying out. It's not necessarily from the pain because probably 95% of the cases that I'm associated with and 
had some form of anesthesia, either it be chloroform or ether. Chloroform was preferred. It, it reacted quicker. Here's a, a, a container of chloroform. Uh, one of the two anesthetics that were available during uh, this conflict, the American Civil War. Uh, it was a godsend because it changed the way our patients were able to recover. It, the patient suffered different and probably lesser side effects than what ether delivered. But ether, I will not discount it because it also works. I've used both. Morphine. This was a processed form of opium, um, a major drug. You could give it orally. You could give it topically in the form of a powder. You could even take in the liquid form using a hypodermic needle and inject it just under the skin near where the injury was, where you wanted to relieve the pain. And here is liquid, uh, the liquid form of opium. Tinctura opi. It's where we've taken grain alcohol and we've put so many ounces of the opium um, sap from the opium poppy um, that's usually in a block uh, processed. And we'll put so many ounces and let it steep for so many days. And out of it comes this liquid uh, that is strong. You would give it in the form of not spoonfuls or tablefuls. Tables is tablespoonfuls, you give it in the form of drops, so many drops per hour. It's very potent. The brutal craft, and it is a brutal craft, and you can see here I have uh, at the t on the table, uh, I'm holding the saw that I use, but here you find a, a saw that would have been used in the 18th century. A very similar saw that had been used in the 16th century. They're utilitarian. They're there to cut bones. Not flesh. We would use the sharp knives to cut the bone or cut the flesh. Here being one of the version of the crooked knife, another crooked knife, that's a nickname they have, as you're trying to cut around the limb, cutting down to the bone. Going back a little further, they didn't necessarily use crooked knives. They used a good, strong, straight knife. But again, cutting all the way to the bone. In my day, I used a sharp knife. One that we refer to as the Liston knife. Dr. Liston gave it its name because he was probably one of the fastest surgeons of his, of his time. Uh, in the 1830s, he, within short minutes he could remove an arm or a leg. People in London where he practiced would actually go, would want him because of his skill with a knife. And he would do his surgeries in, amput in, in, in theaters, in amputation theaters, where you're surrounded with the people on different levels above you. And he would walk in and he would look his assistants and he'd say, gentlemen, time and he would go to work. Now one of the things that we saw a progression away as we were doing amputations is we got away from cauterizing the wounds, the, the ends of the stump. When you go back to the 1500s you were still seeing a lot of cauterizations, even using uh, a caustic powder to do the burning, or maybe a boiling hot oil. Elderberry oil was one of the preferred oils. And on a, on a battlefield, a French servant, surgeon by the name of Ambrose Paré, he found himself in a position where he had run out of elderberry oil. And so he made a concoction using turpentine, using egg whites, and, he made a, and rose water, and he made a paste. But he really didn't think that his, pace, that, that his patients would survive. In fact, to the point that he arose the next day at, at sunrise, 
going to to inspect those patients that he had used the this this paste as the seal on the stump versus the Scott the 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 fiery hot oil. And did you know what he found? He actually found that the patients that he had applied his paste were doing much better. They were actually healing better. That their wounds were less inflamed. And then as he began his stu continued studies, he figured out, you know, rather than burning these blood vessels closed, sealing them up with scabs, using a hot cautery iron. What if we ligature them? What if we tie them off? And he started that process. He actually, what he did is he figured out something the Greeks had learned and that, that we had lost during the Dark Ages, during the time when the church had pretty well taken over medical care and, and there was a, a lot of, a lot of uh, there was a different feel about how you handle patients. He, he learned that ligaturing technique and he brought it forward in time and it remained with us. You probably saw cauterization go completely away as a way to seal off wounds or seal the ends of amputations. Um, I would say somewhere in the early 1700s. And it was ligaturing and you would use, of course you could use linen thread, but you preferred with silk. And guess what? Even today we do that. And we use olive tip, we use forceps, like these olive tip forceps, to actually pull out and so that we can actually tie off the blood vessels. And it, it again, it improved the recovery of the patient. But probably the biggest thing that has made an effect on how I treat patients as a Union Army surgeon has been the pioneering efforts of Dr. Jonathan Letterman. Now, Dr. Letterman started out like, like so many Army surgeons. He, he graduated school in Philadelphia, and he joined the Union Army, and he served out west, served down in Florida, and then he came home. He, he spent a bit of time in Europe looking at hospital design, looking at ambulances, and then a friend took over as Surgeon General. Surgeon General Hammond then brought in Letterman to be the medical director of the Army of the Potomac. Up until this time, Army care had been uh, sporadic, had, been, uh, had not been great. There were problems with logistically with supplies. There were problems with having these regiments that we have to remember are state regiments. That, that when, it, when it, there's battle going on, that the only people they wanted to treat, the only soldiers they wanted to treat, were their own. Where if I were a wounded from another regiment, I would, might be turned away and told to go to find my own hospital. Under Letterman, all this changed. The first thing he did was he, he took away from the quartermaster department the supply chain. If I needed supplies, medical supplies, before Letterman, I had to go directly to the quartermaster, Army quartermaster department. And sometimes I got my supplies and sometimes I didn't. Sometimes the during a battle, the quartermaster department would, would be direct its wagon drivers to unload medical supplies and to haul munitions, thus causing another problem for me because I'm needing my supplies to take care of our wounded. Letterman ended all that. Letterman also changed the way we, we received drugs and in the, in the fact that I couldn't I could have only a limited supply, a 30-day supply. There were sometimes I had a lot of one medication and none of this medication. He standardized all that. And he, and he created, along with several other um, people like Charles Squibb, Squibb, which uh, in the future 
uh, will be a big name in the medical supply business, he created panniers. And they were created and, and shipped out to the, the various regimental surgeons. Then it came to ambulances. Well, his idea with ambulances go back to Napoleon Bonaparte's surgeon, Dominique Leray. And Dominique Leray figured out, implemented, first of all, the flying ambulance service, and he, he patterned it after uh, the French flying artillery. And then he changed the way hospitals were organized and made them much more agile and quicker to respond to battles. And then Leray, he changed uh, logistics and smoothed that, uh, smoothed those those uh, areas out. Letterman studied Leray, and from that. He took the ambulance corps, he had his own dedicated wagons, the ambulance corps had its own dedicated command, and it was, its idea was to take men off the field as quickly as possible and get them to the various aid stations. That was another creation of Letterman, where he would ta be taken to the aid station, which was close to the battle line, and you would be triaged. Now, triage is a word in my time, I don't know. It's not used. But what we would do is we would ascertain what wound the, pe the person had, and if the person was seriously wounded, he would immediately be loaded on another ambulance and carried to one of the hospitals that would be established, that would be further away from the battle line. And for those soldiers that merely had minor wounds, they would be bandaged up and sent back to their regiment. Now, on the hospital level, he took the regimental hospitals and, the, and he moved them up to both the brigade level, or if you had a corps together, an army corps together, in other words, a larger group of men, you would move it up to the division level. And at the division level, he would, he would appoint various surgeons, practitioners, he would take them, regardless of how long they'd been in service, regardless of how uh, long um, or who they were, and he would put the best practitioners, the best operators in place on the division level. And sometimes you might have an assistant surgeon in the on the division level as an operator and a full surgeon at, at the age station doing triage. But he put in the people that knew what they were doing and could do it the quickest and the best way. And this system worked out. Wasn't quite liked by a lot of the older practitioners, but in, it worked so well that it changed, it revolutionized the way medical care was done. Hmm. Within, within 72 hours at the Battle of Gettysburg, all the wounded were off the battlefield and all of them had, had been taken care of. They were all in hospitals. And that is completely the opposite the way it was in the very beginning of the war. As medicine ha has marched through time in a military setting, um, we have learned through necessity, through the mother of invention, through the fact that we want to heal and not harm, that we want to see more of our patients live than die, we've advanced. We've grown. And we keep growing and we keep advancing. Because as we learn one new thing, it spurs us on to something else. And at the time of the Civil War, we've learned that the four humors, that theory is not really, it really has nothing to do with, the, with our patients. We're learning that 
this whole theory on miasmas, bad air, it's not explaining certain things. But we're learning that the use of antiseptic materials, such as a bromine or carbolic acid, you know, we're seeing our patients recover with less infection. We haven't figured out why, but we're right there. We're on the cusp. We're on the cusp of learning something new. And anything that we can learn new that can save a life, well, that's what we're here to do.